Good evening. You're watching the news at 7.30 on ATV. I'm Edna Te. And I'm Raymond Yang. Here are tonight's top stories. Single mother gets five years in jail for dumping baby girl in a rubbish bin and claiming she was kidnapped by a mainlander. Health authorities investigate as scandal over Taiwanese snacks cooked in gutter oil spreads to Hong Kong. Fresh chicken back on the menu as mainland imports resume after half a year. A single mother has been jailed for five years for dumping her baby daughter's body in a rubbish bin and making up a story about the infant being snatched from her pram by a mainlander. The court criticized her for wasting police time with a massive manhunt for a culprit who didn't exist and a desperate search in a landfill for the baby's body. ATV's Arthur Urquiola reports. Ng Tin Yan was driven to the district court in a prison van today to learn her fate after pleading guilty last month to her crimes. The single mother had admitted preventing the lawful burial of her six-month-old daughter in November last year and perverting the course of justice by triggering a massive police manhunt, claiming the infant had been snatched from her pram in Kowloon City. The 33-year-old woman later admitted that she had wrapped her daughter's body in a plastic bag and thrown it into a rubbish bin after finding her dead at home. This prompted police to launch an unsuccessful search of the Chungkwan O landfill. In handing down sentence, District Judge Amanda Woodcock said Ng had clearly planned to mislead the police. She pointed out while Ng had claimed her daughter stopped breathing between 7 p.m. and 8 p.m. on the 18th of November, she was found to have gone online at around noon that day to search for information on such cases. Woodcock said the defendant's actions had prolonged the police investigation, making it harder to find the infant's body. The judge said Ng is the only one who knows what really happened in a case that shocked the public. Ng was given a four-year jail term for preventing her daughter's lawful burial and three years for perverting the course of justice. Part of the sentences will be served at the same time, meaning a five-year term for Ng. The single mother caused a stir last November by claiming that a woman with a mainland accent had asked for directions while a man snatched the baby from her pram. The allegation added fuel to anti-mainland sentiment in Hong Kong, and she was widely condemned by the public when she later admitted she had actually left the baby at home alone while she went to a violin class. She took a nap when she returned home and found that her daughter was dead when she awoke. Her story about the kidnap fell apart under police interrogation. Arthur Akiola, ATV News. A gutter oil scandal in Taiwan has spread to Hong Kong, with health authorities investigating whether any Taiwanese snacks widely sold here may be contaminated. One Taiwanese firm has already confirmed it sold dumplings here cooked in gutter oil, and there's no assurance that other snacks are safe. ATV's Ang Chang reports. Just weeks after a mainland rotten meat scandal shocked fast food diners in Hong Kong, the city is facing another food scare. This time, it's a gutter oil scam in Taiwan. The police on the island yesterday raided an illegal plant, which produced hundreds of tons of tainted oil that was sold to companies across the island. Products from some of those firms are sold in Hong Kong, and what's worrying is that no one is able to give them the all clear. One firm, Black Bridge, has admitted that some 1,000 rice dumplings cooked in the tainted oil were sold here in May and June. Supermarket chain Welcome also sells dumplings supplied by one of the affected Taiwanese firms, but it denies selling any tainted products and has taken them off the shelves as a precaution. Uh, the uh, Center for Food Safety uh, is actually, uh, we are very concerned and they are already uh, following up and checking uh, the, the records to make sure that the, these um, uh, related food products are not uh, on sale in Hong Kong. Health Minister Ko Wing Man today urged all retailers and importers who may have dealt with the tainted oil or food products to contact the Center for Food Safety. He said it would take time to investigate. Hong Kong health officials are checking import documents and will notify the public immediately if they find anything relevant. They're on their toes this time after being widely criticized for their slow response to the tainted meat scandal and their failure to bring McDonald's to account for its questionable conduct. Some of the gutter oil was used to produce cooked meat in Taiwan. While Hong Kong currently does not require permits for imported cooked meat, traders have to keep records. 
Reports from Taiwan say Changguan, which processes cooking oil, bought 240 tons of gutter oil from the unlicensed factory. The processor, which didn't know that the oil was dodgy, mixed it with lard and sold it to 235 domestic food companies across Taiwan. Health officials have ordered them to withdraw their products immediately. One firm, Wei Chuan, whose products included minced meat, spicy minced meat, cucumber pork and pork floss, has pulled its items from the market. Another company, Chi Mei, which makes mooncakes, pineapple cakes and dumplings, also recalled its products. Consumers were told they could get refunds. Six people were arrested when police raided the unlicensed factory in the southern city of Kaohsiung. Officers found rusty tanks in which oil from drains and sewers was mixed before being put into new bottles for sale to food outlets. And Chang, ATV News. While the British government is trying not to upset China over the universal suffrage controversy in Hong Kong, lawmakers in the UK are refusing to scrap an inquiry that has angered Beijing. The extent of China's anger has been revealed in letters sent to the British Parliament warning them to back off. China is furious with British lawmakers who have launched an inquiry into whether Beijing is honoring the terms of the Sino-British Joint Declaration of 1984, under which Hong Kong is supposed to have a high degree of autonomy and executive power to run its own affairs. The last straw for Beijing came in July, when two leading figures in Hong Kong's democracy movement, Anson Chan and Martin Lee, testified before the Foreign Affairs Committee and raised fears about the one country, two systems policy being undermined. The committee has rejected Beijing's demand to stop the inquiry, insisting that it has legitimate concerns about Hong Kong's future and is not meddling in China's internal affairs. Details have now emerged of two letters the Chinese side sent to British lawmakers, reflecting Beijing's anger and worry. One letter from the Foreign Affairs Committee of the National People's Congress complains that the inquiry is a highly inappropriate act which constitutes interference in China's internal affairs. What your committee did has sent a wrong political signal to the outside world and disrupted Hong Kong's political reform process and will have a negative impact on relations between our two countries. The letter tells them to bear in mind the larger picture of China-UK relations and Hong Kong's prosperity and stability. The other letter from Beijing's ambassador to London, Liu Xiaoming, stresses that China is firmly opposed to any interference in Hong Kong affairs by any foreign country and by any means. It will ultimately harm the interests of Britain, Liu warns. The ambassador goes on to strongly advise British lawmakers not to visit Hong Kong as part of their inquiry, saying it won't be helpful. China has been provoked further by former Governor Chris Patton, declaring that the election system Beijing has decided for Hong Kong is more or less what happens in Iran, and that London has a moral obligation to speak out. But the British Foreign Office has now welcomed the confirmation that China's objective is for the election of Hong Kong's chief executive through universal suffrage. It issued a statement saying there is no perfect model for political reform, but the important thing is that the people of Hong Kong have a genuine choice and a real stake in the outcome. The Foreign Office acknowledged the restrictions laid down by the National People's Congress Standing Committee will disappoint democracy campaigners who are arguing for a more open nomination process. But it expressed hope that the next period of consultation will produce arrangements which allow a meaningful advance for democracy in Hong Kong. The pan-democrats have been hit by infighting over how to respond to Beijing's decision to allow only limited democracy in Hong Kong. Most of them have rejected a radical colleague's call for everyone to resign from Lechko, and one of them is blaming his allies for the stalemate. 
nearly a week after Beijing adopted a hardline framework for Hong Kong's political reform, the pan-democrats have been left squabbling over how to respond. The radicals want to hit back hard, and lawmaker Albert Chan of People Power is urging his 26 pan-democratic colleagues to quit their logical seats in a show of unity. Nothing can send a stronger message to the public than all of us resigning at the same time, Chan told listeners on the radio program this morning. But Wu Qiwai from the Democratic Party warns that the tactic would backfire. He argues that a mass resignation would cost them seats they can't afford to lose in the legislature dominated by Beijing loyalists, as they still hold the power to veto the final reform package by denying the government the two-thirds majority support it needs. Civic Party legislator Ronnie Tong also rejected the mass resignation idea. He reminded his colleagues that anyone is barred from standing in by elections for six months after they quit. The rules were revised two years ago, after five pan-democrats quit their seats in a similar exercise in 2010, only to win them back in what they touted as a de facto referendum on universal suffrage. Tom, seen as a moderate who is willing to compromise, said he is disappointed with his allies' failure to negotiate with Beijing in a rational and pragmatic manner. While most pan-democrats know Beijing leaders prefer soft diplomacy, they resorted to threats which achieved nothing in the end, he lamented. Chief Executive Leung Qianying said today that the second public consultation will be conducted as soon as possible. Responding to students planning strikes to demand genuine universal suffrage, he insisted that Hong Kong people getting the vote for their next leader in 2017 is a big step forward. A batch of 6,800 live chickens from the mainland arrived in Hong Kong today, the first to cross the border in more than six months. A ban on live poultry imports was lifted after local health officials reached an agreement with their mainland counterparts over quarantine and safety measures. ATV's Winner Wong reports. The first batch of live mainland chickens coming to Hong Kong in half a year were sent just in time for the Mid-Autumn Festival on Monday. Several trucks carrying 6,800 birds arrived at the Cheung Sha Wan wholesale market this afternoon. The chickens had been quarantined at their farms for five days before tissue and blood samples were taken from them at the Mankam To control point. They will remain at the wholesale market overnight for distribution to wet markets tomorrow at the earliest if the tests show no problems. The government gave an assurance that measures have been taken to reduce the risk of avian influenza, or AI. Uh, and for the surveillance part uh, and the testing of the um, uh, AI, uh, we have actually uh, come to compromise uh, with the uh, mainland authorities, and so therefore uh, it will be actually the same as what we have proposed previously. Chinese authorities are now required to visit farms to personally take samples for testing, instead of farmers sending in samples they've collected themselves. Live poultry entering Hong Kong must be quarantined for five days before crossing the border. Now that fresh chicken will be on the dinner table again, the focus is on prices. <laughs> Chen Mingtun, who heads the Poultry Wholesale and Retail Association, says wholesale prices for mainland chickens will be around $25 to $28 a caddy. He said after the festival, wholesale prices could fall to as low as $20, and he hopes the retail price will dip too. Retailers charge about $60 to $70 a caddy for locally raised chickens, 12,000 of which are sent to markets daily. With 7,000 live chickens arriving each day after the end of the ban, consumers are hoping they'll be paying less. Imports of live poultry from the mainland were suspended in February after a batch tested positive for the H7N9 strain of bird flu. The ban was meant to last four months, but was extended indefinitely when local and mainland authorities disagreed on safety measures. Winawang, ATV News. Overseas, Ukraine claims 2,000 Russian soldiers have been killed in fighting in the east of the country, although Moscow is insisting it has no troops there. The claim was made as NATO threatened fresh sanctions against Moscow and as pro-Russian rebels and Ukraine opened peace talks. Vehicles belonging to pro-Russian rebels were engulfed in flames after being shelled by government forces near the city of Mariupol in eastern Ukraine yesterday. Tension remained high even as efforts to achieve peace continued. 
This elderly man was injured as he tried to reach his family after the village was shelled. They're dying for nothing. I can't even get to them, he said. The man's plight and that of others in eastern Ukraine came under the spotlight, far away in Wales, where NATO leaders were meeting. Ukrainian's Western-backed president Petro Poroshenko was the leader of the moment, although his country is not a member of the alliance. While NATO pledged not to use force to defend Ukraine, it warned Russia to stay out of the country. The international community um, must respond determinedly if Russia were to intervene uh, further uh, in uh, Ukraine, respond through uh, deeper, broader, tougher uh, economic sanctions that would definitely hurt uh, Russian economy and isolate uh, Russia further. NATO claimed several thousand Russian troops and hundreds of tanks were inside Ukraine. Moscow dismissed the allegation as absurd, insisting that Russian speakers in eastern Ukraine rebelled only after pro-Western politicians, with the support of neo-Nazi elements, helped overthrow a previous president who was close to Russia. The conflict has claimed about 2,600 lives since March. NATO last night paid tribute to troops who tried to restore peace in Afghanistan after the U.S.-led invasion in 2001. The Western alliance ends its combat role in Afghanistan at the end of the year, but peace remains elusive. The situation has worsened because of a dispute in the presidential election, causing a political vacuum. Also on the NATO agenda was the threat posed by Islamic State militants who beheaded two U.S. journalists in the past fortnight and warned that a British hostage could be next. NATO was expected to take more coordinated action to stop the extremists from expanding their territory in Syria and Iraq and massacring civilians. Joyce Wu, ATV News. Some of the biggest names in Hollywood have joined fans to pay tribute to comedian Joan Rivers, who has died at the age of 81. The veteran entertainer earned a reputation as a groundbreaking stand-up performer and as a no-holds-barred critic of celebrity fashion. Arthur Urquilla reports. Joan Rivers died in a New York hospital a week after suffering a cardiac arrest. Her daughter Melissa said the veteran comedian passed peacefully, surrounded by family and friends. Rivers had stopped breathing last week while undergoing a procedure on her vocal cords at a clinic. She was rushed to Mount Sinai Hospital, where she had been on life support. Her fans laid flowers outside her apartment as they mourned her death. She did a lot for women in comedy, and it's really sad to see, you know, she was really kind of a, a groundbreaker breaker, and it's sad to see her go. She's, she's a legend. She's an icon. Tributes poured in on social media from some of the biggest names in showbiz, praising Rivers as a pioneering comedian and a one-of-a-kind performer right until the end. I love the Golden Globes. It is the most fun award show of the entire season. Yeah. It's like a, it's like Celebrities a party, bore the you know? brunt of many of Rivers' jokes. Most recently, she took aim at their fashion sense with sharp put-downs on her TV show, Fashion Police. But she didn't spare herself, joking openly about her plastic surgery. I'll show you fear. Born Joan Malinsky in Brooklyn, Rivers started as a sketch writer for The Ed Sullivan Show before her first big break in the 1960s. This is the clothes I wore the first time I'm wearing. 1965 hair. that's why I was talking about. This happened with appearances on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson, which she guest hosted frequently. That kick-started her career as a stand-up comedian, with her raspy voice and no-holds-barred humor becoming her trademarks. Here's Joan River! She went on to host her own talk shows and established herself as a top fashion critic and fixture on the Hollywood red carpet. Joan Rivers, the queen of barbed one-liners, was 81. Arthur Akiola, ATV News. In other world headlines, scientists have announced the discovery of the bones of what could have been Earth's largest ever inhabitant. But first, a horror find in a London suburb that triggered fears of a terrorist attack. Here's ATV's Joyce Wu. Police officers who rushed to a house in North London after a stranger was spotted with a knife found an elderly woman with her head cut off. 
The gruesome discovery in the suburb of Edmonton triggered fears that the victim was killed by terrorists, following high-profile beheadings by militants in the Middle East. But the police ruled out terrorism. On arrival, police officers found a woman collapsed in the back garden of a house. She was pronounced dead at the scene. A 25-year-old man has been arrested on suspicion of murder and is now in our custody. The victim was identified as an 82-year-old woman of Italian descent. Fast food workers in New York have gone on strike to demand at least 15 US dollars an hour in wages. Most currently earn about half that amount. We're not asking for so much. We're just asking for about so much so we could be able to live and survive in New York. The police arrested 15 strikers who staged a sit-in on a road. Fast food workers in more than 150 U.S. cities have also taken action to demand a living wage. Scientists believe that the biggest creature ever to have roamed the planet lived in Argentina 77 million years ago. The fossils of the behemoth were remarkably complete and well-preserved, scientists said. It was about, um, its head would have been maybe two and a half stories up in the air, and it would have weighed 65 tons. That's heavier than a jumbo jet. Researchers studying the enormous dinosaur have given it an equally colossal name, Dreadnoughtus, or Fearing Nothing. Joyce Wu, 